Hi, my name is Trevor Dunmore. I'm with the Australian Mango Industry Association. Today we're here with Andrew McNish, Senior Researcher from Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. Um, we're here to talk about resin canal discoloration, which has become a major issue for our industry over the last three seasons. Resin canal discoloration has been around in industry for many years, but only in the last three seasons has become a, an issue both for growers, wholesalers and retailers. Um, Andrew has been doing some research over the last two seasons uh, in association with the Northern Territory Department and Cameron McConkey uh, through a HIA funded research project which is using mango grower levies matched by federal government funds. Andrew, can you explain what resin canals are? Yeah, Trevor, the resin canal is actually a very distinctive normal feature of, of mango fruit. Um, they, they function to store sap or resin under pressure in, in the fruit and they form a very complex network in, in the fruit themselves. And we, we typically, typically don't notice resin canals uh, because they are generally flesh coloured. Okay, so that's what resin canals are, but what's causing them to get discoloured and go basically black? Yeah, so as you mentioned, a couple of seasons ago we first started to really notice that uh, these dark brown to, to black resin canals in, in mango fruit, um, very unsightly looking defect, and um, Sometimes even we, we see them as dark outlines through the fruit's skin, so it's not just always confined to symptoms in, in the flesh. Um, and, and because RCD, or, or resin canal discoloration, um, is, is something that typically occurs as fruit ripen, we don't get an opportunity to grade out those fruit when, when they're in the shed. So there are some, some genuine concerns about the, the impact of this uh, disorder on consumer purchasing behaviour. So what we've done over the past season is, is to work uh, with, with the Northern Territory Department and, and growers and packers in the Northern Territory, particularly in the Darwin production area, as this, this area seems to, to have a higher risk of, of developing fruit with RCD. And we've uh, developed eight preliminary findings uh, and I'll just walk you through those one by one now. So the first preliminary finding from our research is that the incidence of, of RCD uh, can vary quite uh, considerably between farms, often in a very close geographic uh, distribution and also they will vary across time during the season, so even from the same farm at different harvest dates. Our second main finding is that RCD can be found in green fruit very occasionally in the orchard, but it's only in fruit that have quite severe physical injury, so a damage from a, from a fruit bat or, or a magpie goose, uh, or in fruit that have very severe pathogen infection. A third main finding has been that the incidence and severity of RCD can often be higher in fruit that are commercially handled. So these are fruit that are commercially picked and packed and transported to market, uh, often have higher incidence of RCD than fruit from the same trees that we ripen directly off the tree and maintain the fruit in the Northern Territory as library trays. Now, RCD can be present in the flesh but not always visible in the skin. This presents a challenge when we're assessing fruit in the market and relying on external symptoms only. We also know that uh, RCD severity increases over time as the fruit develop uh, from, from a firm ripe through to an eating ripe stage. So RCD is not generally present in green fruit, but it reaches maximum expression in fruit at the eating ripe stage. And some of our trials have also indicated that RCD incidence can be higher in fruit that are picked early. So these are fruit that are picked at a, at a lower dry matter content. RCD can also be high in fruit that are picked soon after a rain event. And more recently, we're, our research is hinting that RCD symptoms may also be associated with bacteria. And I'll start to describe some of that work in, in just a minute. But to, to summarise the work that we've completed during the past 12 months, we focused on four main areas. The first was to conduct a survey of growers and packers 
in the Darwin area about their experience with, with this defect. Secondly, we established a standard assessment procedure for quantifying RCD. Thirdly, we completed sequential sampling trials, so sampling fruit at different stages along the supply chain from tree to market. And fourthly, confirmed the possible involvement of bacteria in RCD. So just to go through each of those briefly to provide you a bit of a snapshot of the main findings. In terms of the survey of, of practices, 27 uh, businesses were, were surveyed. Nine of those businesses viewed RCD as a major economic issue and four of those businesses claimed that RCD actually accounted for up to 10 to 30 percent lost production. We noted that there was considerable variation in each business's on-farm management, their picking strategies, their packing and transportation practices as, as well also varied. So we documented some very interesting findings there. But most importantly, we identified some farms with a history of relatively high RCD and these farms and indeed packers were uh, very keen to work with us uh, on this research project. So the second area that we, we worked on this last season was developing a standard assessment procedure. And as you can see from this graph here, we, the incidence of, of RCD increases uh, dramatically over time. So it starts off as, as basically not evident in green fruit, but once fruit reach uh, a partially ripe stage, see from the second graph here that as fruit start to soften they become more rubbery texture they develop about 50 percent yellow skin that's when we start to see this tremendous increase in in RCD symptoms and RCD reaches a maximum when the fruit are uh, within one to two days of, of the eating ripe stage where where fruit have uh, close to hundred percent yellow skin and an eating ripe texture We've, we've taken some photographs of fruit at different severity levels of, of RCD. Uh, firstly, we, we inspected the exterior of fruit, just looking at the skin and expressing the percentage area of skin that's affected by RCD symptoms. We then used the vegetable, vegetable peeler to remove the skin from these fruit. And again, we estimated the surface area of the flesh that was affected by the RCD symptoms. So we're using this procedure now uh, to assess for RCD in all our trials. Uh, so that's both for us in Queensland, but also our colleagues in the Northern Territory. And we're certainly keen to see others in industry use this procedure. The key point really is that we should be assessing fruit for RCD when they're at the eating ripe stage. Uh, this makes sure that we're all on the same page when we're talking about the extent of RCD, but also gives us an opportunity to consistently measure the, the maximum extent of RCD in fruit that consumers will potentially be purchasing. So the third area of work that we focused on during the past season was the sequential sampling study. And this, the rationale behind this work was to identify potential supply chain handling factors that could exacerbate expression of RCD. We worked with nine uh, orchards in the Northern Territory, predominantly in the Darwin production area, and also three packing sheds. We harvested fruit at the same time that the commercial crews were in the orchard, and we actually sampled from nine different stages along the chain, which is depicted here in in this slide. So we harvested or sampled three fruit directly off the tree, or three trays directly off the tree. We also sampled three trays from the harvest bins, another three trays from the end of the pack line, and then additional trays were also sampled at the end of the pack line and subjected to simulated and commercial transport through to the major markets in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. And what this sequential sampling work showed us was that in six of the nine farms surveyed, there was an increase in RCD incidence and severity for fruit 
that was sampled at the very end of the chain. So fruit that had been commercially transported and ripened. So a higher incidence of RCD in those fruit compared to the same fruit from the same trees that were just directly ripened off those trees and the fruit were just maintained in the Northern Territory as library trays. So what we, when we look at this graph, we, we can't really identify one particular step in the chain that was responsible or contributed to that increase in incidence. What we see is, is a more cumulative or incremental increase in, in the incidence and severity of RCD as we progress along the chain. So this is really interesting and it's, it's an area that we want to focus on more. We want to get a better handle on this so that we hopefully can resolve this issue for the industry. The fourth area that we, we worked on this season was looking at the role or the potential role of bacteria in RCD. And this work was based on some findings from the previous season where our team of, of pathologists in North Queensland had identified bacteria in dark resin canals, so in fruit that had RCD, and that these bacteria were not recovered from healthy fruit without the RCD. So it gave us a bit of a lead to follow on this season. What we did during the current season was to sample a lot more fruit from the market. So we sampled a lot of fruit from the markets that had visual symptoms of RCD and additional fruit that had no symptoms of RCD. So we can look at that comparison. And we found that actually 61 to 100% of different fruit samples with the RCD symptoms also contained uh, these bacteria in the resin canals. And one of those species uh, called Pantoia agglomerans was most prevalent and this species is, has been a point of interest and focus for us. We also sampled water uh, solutions from harvest aids and also from dump water in sheds in the Northern Territory. And we're currently analysing those samples for the presence of bacteria. One of the key findings though from this work was there's tremendous variation in, in the clarity of those water samples. Some of the water samples were, were perfectly clear, others were quite dirty. We noticed that this water can, can get dirty very quickly, so it highlighted to us that there is a need to make sure we're always keeping our water clean so that we can maximise fruit quality. So really just to, to sum up the work from the past season, again I'm just uh, showing you on the slide here the eight main findings that we uh, most interested in at the moment and we have some data there to, to support these, these preliminary findings. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do obviously to uh, come up with the actual cause or causes of, of RCD. Basically what we, we're now fairly sure is that it is not caused by a single factor, that it is caused by sets of interacting factors and that's what makes it such a complex disorder and such a challenge to, to get a full handle on. But we're, we're certainly working hard towards understanding the, this, this disorder uh, with a view to coming up with some appropriate control measures. Great, Andrew, that's a great summary of what you've been doing so far. Um, certainly, it's really good research you've been doing, but we've got a fair way to go yet. But there are probably four or five key messages in your research that show that if growers can do some things to, that will help reduce the incidence of resin canal. We don't have a cure yet, but we can certainly see that there are some trends in the, in the research. Mm. Do you want to talk about those five, four or five research Yeah, that's right. Areas? As you mentioned, we've got some preliminary leads there. Uh, we don't have the, the silver bullet yet, but uh, at this point in time, our advice or recommendations to growers would be to continue uh, making sure they're following best practice and, and the four or five key ones that we think are at this point in time is to make sure you limit stress on trees and fruit uh, because we know stressed trees and fruit have a tendency to developing um, physiological defects. The second one is to make sure you're always harvesting fruit at the correct maturity stage. Thirdly, uh, practice good orchard hygiene and also good hygiene in the shed and then really making sure that you're pre-cooling transporting fruit at the recommended temperatures through to market 
And, and really, the other point I would like to make is that it, we'd, we'd value growers uh, making sure they keep good records of when they might have an outbreak of RCD uh, so that we can also try and get a better handle on what might be causing it. Great, thanks Andrew, that's a really good um, summary. But yeah, I think the, the one thing I've seen through your research is that you know, picking at the correct maturity, making sure you're aware of you know, any events like rain and making sure you, you, you manage those events. And also that the issue of hygiene through the, your harvest aid and through your pack line is really, really important, both for RCD and just for all other types of um, diseases and disorders. That's right. We just heard Andrew speak about the project and the research outcomes so far for the project. We're really appreciative of the work Andrew has done and also the work Cameron McConkey from NT Department <coughs> has done. They've been ably supported by staff from both departments, but also we'd like to recognise the funding that has come through, both from voluntary contributions from WEPAC through Mango Grower Levies, with matching from the Federal Government and the project has been managed by Horticulture Innovation Australia.